Hey, Foot Clan, let's get real. Let's talk about your sinuses. Zycam Nasal All Clear keeps your nose clean, clear, and healthy as part of your daily routine, and it's different because it's easy to use and convenient for on-the-go. Only Zycam Nasal All Clear nasal swabs instantly deliver the triple action benefit of protecting, cleansing, and soothing your nasal passage. Oh, so nice. Using a drug-free, non-saline-based moisturizing formula. When in doubt, swab it out. Swab it out. That's what my grandpappy always used to say. <laughs> nasal All Clear quite literally allows you to swab it out, or I, I woke up with, with major nasal dryness due to congestion, and thanks to Zycam's Nasal All Clear, I just swabbed it right out. Available Get at rid Amazon. Of it. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Available at Amazon. Search for Zycam Nasal All Clear. That's A L L C L E A R. Welcome. To the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. The truth is, I'm very happy to be here with you two gentlemen. Is it? Is that the truth? That's the truth, Mike, the fantasy hitman right. I accept your truth. Mike is here. Jason is here. I'm here. Al Borland is here. Judge Giamatti, present, and, accounted for. And most for. importantly, you are here, Foot Clan. The Packers aren't here. The Bills aren't here. Oh, brother. Oh, man. You know that it didn't go well when good old Al Borland goes silent on the Slack channel yep. at the end of a game. I'm, I'd be surprised if he's here five minutes after us talking about it. Are you able to speak yet, Al? Are you Are you doing all right? Yeah, no. that's, no, that's no. exactly <laughs> what you expect. <laughs> Absolutely. He's gone. He has left the building. Yeah. He's like, you promised you weren't going to talk about my Packers anymore. But uh, hard to not talk about the Packers. When So now I was driving. I had to unfortunately leave towards the end of that game. So I, I take the kids and I'm, I'm driving at the end of the game. And I could have been mistaken, but it sounded like they kicked a field goal. <laughs> Um, when there was about two minutes left in that game, down one possession, and I think they were um, near the goal line. Yes, it, th those are accurate, uh, accurate takes from your, your radio broadcast. Okay, hmm. okay, okay, okay. I hate to be that guy, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to volunteer as tribute to be the guy that defends the move. Okay. okay. Oh, please do. <laughs> Try to defeat wait. me because I think it, I, it, you needed a touchdown either way. It seems ridiculous. It seems stupid. But let me just make the case. They ended up kicking the field goal, kicking the ball off. They got to third and long. They make the third and long stop, except for they commit a penalty. Sure. If they don't commit the penalty, they've got the ball with a minute. Aaron Rodgers has, because the, they threw on third down. Aaron Rodgers has the ball. With a minute and 45 seconds, one timeout, mm -hmm. and then the, the, you've got a chance to win the game because there's no now guarantee what does he that need you to get the two-point – He's got to score a touchdown, but he does not need uh, to get a two-point conversion on it, Okay, which now, is let's a say they let's say they missed the two-point conversion after getting a touchdown, right? Yes. Then everything else plays out the exact same, and they, they, they still but need to – But they just to, have to kick a field goal oh, this time. Oh, just a field goal. Incredible. I mean, what cowardice – what absolute cowardice! That to... was the best I could do to defend it. Yeah, <laughs> that was my best. That was my hey, best that, possibility. That's, that's not bad. I mean, because it it worked out. It it almost worked out of them getting the ball back. But that's precisely why you you don't give the ball to someone like Tom Brady. Is so many things can go right for Tom Brady, and all all that all Tom needs to do is get first downs. He's he doesn't have to play for a field goal, which they would have had to play for a field goal had the Packers gone for it successfully and gotten the two point conversion. I I just could not figure out what happened and to get uh a little bit, you know, a, uh talk radio, I guess you would say, because this this isn't usually the stuff we go into, but you now have a completely uh book ended uh uh year for Aaron Rodgers where this thing opened up in absolute disaster in tumult where your team traded up and you you thought 
that your general manager was getting you a playmaker because your wide receiver crew really needed an upgrade. It wasn't. In fact, it was the team traded up to get your replacement. And then at the end of the game, there's press conferences where people were talking to to Rodgers. Rodgers thought they were going for it on fourth down and talked about how he probably would have done a couple things differently had he known that they were going to kick the ball. Uh, And, look, he made some mistakes, absolutely. But now you, you start the year the way it started. Now you end with another... Uh, you know, chasm between Aaron Rodgers and the coaching staff. Uh, it's going to be a really fun off season for Green Bay Packers fans as they they wake up every day hoping that Aaron Rodgers has not turned nuclear and is saying, "I'm done here. You guys can play Jordan Love. I'm going to go play somewhere else." With 19 seconds left in the first half and a fourth down, the the Tampa Bay Buccaneers chose to go for it and try to score and did they tried score. to win the game they're trying to win the game and and turns out that play mattered so yeah i i like in the your season is on the line go for it especially it's different if you're if your uh team's makeup is we are a defense run the ball these are two of the best quarterbacks of all time your identity is in their hands that's it's so how you hard win. it's really hard to be a head coach because look i mean a week ago andy reed made a fourth down call that worked out he could have gone the easy route where you're not criticized in the media matt lafleur could have done it too going forward on fourth down was certainly the i think we all agree it was probably the the right play you want to lose with your mvp you lose there, you don't get criticized. Now you're going to get criticized for what you did it's not easy yep. to be a head coach because it no, comes down to if it works it works. I mean, the analytics people want to throw it in your face that you had a higher percentage chance of winning by kicking the field goal. Here's that's the deal. The, that's the analytics. Yeah. Here, here's well, there's there's conflicting analytics on that, but um, the the reality is, if he had gone for it there, down eight at the goal line, and he had not kicked, we wouldn't be talking about that as like correct, correct. Like it it, it wasn't a well, if he did that and got it wrong. No, that was just a. Was, I can't well, wrap my head and around. that's kind of my point at least it was if you want to say anything it, it's more courageous to do the thing that you'll be criticized for if you think it's the right thing to do in the moment that's all sure, my point absolutely yeah, which is is fair it's um just to, to wrap it up if you told me Tom Brady would finish the game with 280 passing yards three touchdowns but three interceptions I would say oh well how much did Aaron Rodgers win by like that is not a line that is not a championship game winning line for yeah. Tom Brady. But as you said, Mike, this is a fantasy football show. We've right. got the truth about running backs to get into. I was so close to a preseason Super Bowl prediction that came true. Tampa Bay, Buffalo, it didn't happen. The Chiefs are just too good. I, you I heard bet something. bet against Mahomes. Well, goodness. Yeah, and that's not something I did on purpose. I just like the Bills. Uh, but you can't get through Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes. Saw some stat this morning. I don't remember how many games it was, but it was like Patrick Mahomes hasn't lost a game by more than one possession since it's all 2016. Of his games. Yeah, it's all, it's all of his games. And in 2016, he was in college. It's just uh, it's hard to comprehend how good he is. And now we get Patrick Mahomes, Tom Brady in a Super Bowl. This is the way it should be. What more can you ask for than that? Uh Lots more to get into. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. The fantasyfootballers.com is the website. I encourage you to go check it out. A lot of new content getting up there. Super Bowl Sunday, speaking of which, <laughs> that is when the ultimate draft kit, our baby, our pride and joy, goes on pre sale. And if you've been with us for years, you know what the ultimate draft kit does for your preparation. And you know that if you get it early, that's your greatest possible benefit. We give you a lot of, we give you a discount, but we give you a lot of bonuses, and we have something. I so well, do because, I do I leak this out at this point in time? Yes, yes, we will leak this out because last year, you know, the, the previous years, if you supported the show, you pre-ordered, you do get it at the cheapest possible price, and then you get access to our official rookie rankings and dynasty rankings, dynasty startup rankings, and we put those out right after the draft, so you get. You know, a couple weeks access to these rankings before the actual UDK comes out on June first, and we said we got we got to be able to upgrade. 
upgrade yourself. And we have done that. And then, now you're putting the ball on the tee for yes, me. Is uh, that yeah, what's yeah. happening? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're up. Historically, we've sold the UDK <laughs> and we've sold the UDK combo, which is the UDK and it comes with the DFS pass. For those of you that play DFS, it's access to the DFS pass throughout the season, which has been incredible. It delivered for listeners this past year in a big way. And uh, look, you still get that in the combo. But the UDK is no longer just the UDK or the UDK combo. It is now the UDK Plus, Bing. which means you get access not only to the DFS Pass, but you're going to get access to the brand new, what Mike was alluding to, Dynasty Pass, which is a completely brand new resource for the Dynasty player, and you will get access instantaneously on mm -hmm. pre-order. So in essence, when you get the UDK Plus, you're not waiting for anything. You're not even waiting for the draft to get your rookie rankings. You're getting a robust dynasty tool and the UDK and the DFS pass. And we're going to be bringing you a draft analyzing tool this year that will grade your draft. It will give you your weaknesses, your strengths, individual, which one of us three likes your team more. This is a huge upgrade for 2021. Yeah, the, the, the draft analyzer is something we kind of used to do this a long time ago before the Ultimate Draft Kit. People loved to have kind of these, the outlook. Who doesn't the love a grade? Oh, yeah, yeah you, you want the grade, but you also want to know what, what you need to look for in the season. Uh, and we've been, you know, trying to figure out how to build that for a long time. So this year, having the, the draft analyzer, the Dynasty Pass, the uh, DFS Pass, and all sorts of upgrades in the UDK, we're super excited so that will be available for pre-order at the cheapest price, uh, Super Bowl Sunday. And l let me just mention, the price for the UDK Plus is the exact same price that the combo was. No! So we're, we're adding the Impossible! Dynasty, we're adding the Dynasty <laughs> Pass. We're adding the Draft Analyzer. You get the DFS Pass, and we're not raising the price at all. So this is just an expansion. Which I think is a ter terrible idea. It's yeah, a very we, we bad tried business to talk decision. Andy into it, and An Andy had your backs, everybody. Is <laughs> is me and Jason over here? We're like, this is it. Three hundred dollars. We came to an agreement with uh, Brooks to subsidize that additional cost. Yes, so <laughs> it was normally going to be about a thousand dollars. Brooks is paying a subsidy on your behalf. He's keeping the price low, but this is. <laughs> And Brooks, I just want to say thank you so much for, for using your wealth in such a positive way for the industry. You're welcome. Okay. All right. He, is, Good. he loves the Foot Clan, man. <laughs> All right. Truth about the running back position momentarily. Let's get into some news, though. We have some things to talk about. News and notes from around the league. All right. This was huge news. Oh, this offseason. You know, it's not normal to have franchise quarterbacks moving teams in an offseason. Mm -mm. But here you are with Deshaun Watson, potentially moving teams. Yeah, maybe. And a new report, the Lions and Matthew Stafford, they've mutually agreed to part ways this offseason. The team is going to explore trade options in the coming weeks for their star quarterback. So many teams in need of quarterback, the quarterback position. Matthew Stafford's 33 years old. I absolutely adore Matthew Stafford. You're talking about a 33-year-old franchise quarterback with top five arm talent that's going to have a new home. Now, when, I, when this first happened, I got kind of emotional about this thought that the team thought they're better off without Matthew Stafford. I've been corrected by the Detroit fans. From what I'm hearing, it's much more about giving Matthew Stafford an opportunity, a mutual respect, a sense that this team is being built. Look, Dan Campbell, six-year deal. Team's mm -hmm. being built from the ground up. They're not going to let Matthew Stafford kind of just be a pin cushion behind center for the next couple of years as they rebuild. So I want to just apologize for reacting so harshly to the news because if that is indeed the the, the reality of the situation, then they're doing right by Matthew Stafford. Yeah, yeah and, and doing right by him is going to include trading him to a good team. That could be someone like the Indianapolis Colts, who I think are – you know, among the front runners um, could be the San Francisco 49ers. I hope it's not. Could be New England. Better than Jimmy Garoppolo. Absolutely. New England Patriots. So it'll be very interesting to see where he goes. In the meantime, the only thing we do know is that if he if he does go somewhere else, either via trade or via some kind of cut, um, the Lions get worse. 
the 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 team is worse. Uh, the yep. outlook for uh, DeAndre Swift is unfortunately it it takes a small hit. It's is talent it, is still there? Yeah, because because I I had the opposite reaction. Let me tell you why. Okay. Anthony Lynn joining as offensive coordinator. That's another piece of news. The team is going to be built around an attempt at running and defense without a, a new quarterback. So I just wondered if the volume and attention that Swift is going to get with Anthony Lynn might be better off. Like, I thought about trying to the, get uh, DeAndre Swift. The volume will absolutely – I mean, I think that they will have to build around DeAndre Swift. It's certainly not something saying DeAndre Swift is is gone, is terrible, but where I think he excels the most is in the passing game. You remember every single week he was getting five targets? That's that's a Matthew Stafford special. Well, uh, you know, that Campbell we saw that did with talk about – that he wants to get DeAndre Swift in the slot, and he, like this was just one of his examples of, of after the old old knee knee biter gate that we experienced, which Yarr! was just a Twitter sensation. He then said some very like forward thinking, at least bring you some hope that this man is not bringing a caveman offense, and he'll he'll do the right thing for his players. And he mentioned putting Swift into the slot, but yes, volume will go up, efficiency has to go down if you if you don't have someone who's capable back there and you can just load up against the running back it's yeah Swift is good but I, I don't know if he's that good scoring Look, do, opportunities will be down the the box will be more difficult to run and I think targets total targets even if they move into the slot if you're a bad quarterback versus a Matthew Stafford it's not going to be as valuable could be well, no Galladay no Marvin Jones on this team yeah and Matthew Stafford has been hurt you know, we've seen this team without him. Let me be clear. If the worst player of all time, Chase Daniel, was somehow the quarterback, I would retract any positive things I could say <laughs> about uh, DeAndre Swift. All right. Lots to follow there, though. It will matter who's the quarterback. It will matter what happens in the draft. Um, I mentioned it. Anthony Lynn, former Chargers head coach, is now their offensive coordinator, knows how to run the football. The Eagles hired Colts offensive coordinator Nick Sirianni as their head coach. The Eagles have a new head coach. And uh, I believe uh, Sirianni's like 39 years old, right? He's pretty, one of the younger yeah, coaches in the NFL. He's young. He's he's good. He's worked on a couple of good offenses. And this was as close as they could get to getting Frank Reich back. They're like, oh, man, we should have let him go. Let's get him back. But, uh, yeah, well, I mean, we're going to talk about all these offensive coordinator changes, head coach changes on our head uh, – on our – Coaching changes episode, which is literally my favorite offseason episode coming up. Well, then I'll uh, I'll just blitz some of the news on hires here, and we'll move forward. But uh, they also hired uh, Shane Steichen to be their offensive coordinator. The Colts then, with the absence, had to promote somebody, and it was Marcus Brady, their quarterbacks coach, as their new offensive coordinator. Jacksonville, Daryl Bevel, welcome back. He is now the offensive coordinator in Jacksonville. Uh, Falcons hired Bears passing game coordinator Dave Ragone as their offensive coordinator, and the Jets hired 49ers passing game coordinator Mike LaFleur as their offensive coordinator. Did I get through it all? I wasn't got, hired in any of that news. I did not get any I did not get picked up for even the smallest I opportunity. Actually, I actually did have a dream that I was being interviewed for the Atlanta Falcons head coaching <laughs> job. Did you really? I really did. Genuinely did. And the the real deal breaker for me was we were looking at, at Did you houses. turn it down? I did because I didn't like the house that the that the, the basically if you're the head coach of the Atlanta Falcons you live in that house. It wasn't a very nice house, so I said I can't live here. Thanks, but no thanks. You and your dreams. All right, yeah. Greg Olson has officially announced his retirement. Um Seahawks tight end, Panther, great. Greg yeah, Olson. Yeah, but not the greatest tight end to announce his retirement. Vance McDonald. That's true. Thank you, Jason. Vance McDonald retired from the NFL after eight seasons. Never came to fruition. So we he he burned too bright, man. Burned too bright. We had the stiff arm moment. We had the playoff game. And then, uh, and then kaput. And I think the Vance dance drop is retired forever now as well now it is now it's retired. yeah thank you uh and then Dwayne Haskins a one-year deal with the Pittsburgh Steelers we told you how bad Mason Rudolph was this is proof <laughs> they, they, this is the <laughs> and now they have to all right uh without further ado let's get into the truth You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! 
All right, we're into the running back truth episode. And as always, you'll want to check the website, thefantasyfootballers.com, because we're putting up some pretty sweet articles in Too conjunction. Sweet. Very sweet. 25 running back statistics article is up there right now uh, by Jeff Greenwood. So check that out. But the running back position. Oh, so fun to talk about. The stabilizing force of your fantasy team. And in our truth episode, here's how we're determining consistency. Great games, more than 21 fantasy points. Good games, more than 11. Bust games, fewer than seven. Don't hold the missing games against you. And I got some really, really bad news for you. I'm going to share with you in just a split second here. Oh, no. Uh, but let's go with number one. Alvin Kamara. Mm -hmm. That guy's good. He's pretty good. I, I thought we were going to get our Alvin Kamara drop there, but I, there it oh, is. Oh, there he is. Super Camario himself. He missed the block a couple times. Uh, number one at the position, number three in consistency, was great 33% of the time, good 87% of the time. Oh, man, that's so nice for your fantasy team. Busted one time. One bad game. His? But he, here's the headline news, the bad news, Jason, before you get into Jeez. the good. Sure. His previous three years, 81 receptions, 81 receptions, 81 receptions, and he ended up with 83 this year. Yeah, it's a real shame he had yeah, a chance to go for the quattro, as yeah. we say, and uh, he, he failed by uh, you know outdoing himself. The reality with Alvin Kamara is his – Beginning to the season, the first 10 weeks, the pace that he was on was otherworldly. We're talking Ladanian Tomlinson, all-timer uh, type of season. And then, of course, Drew Brees went down. And that was a very different Camara that we saw. He wasn't bad. Uh, you, ha you know, he had four games with Taysom Hill as a starter. Twice he was a top 12 running back. He was an RB1. He had his one bust game during that time. Um, but those four games were like, four of his six worst games of the season, and now you have the presumption that Drew Brees is gone. So the the truth about the truth about the twenty twenty Alvin Kamara was that he was as good as, if not the best back in the league when he had Drew Brees, and he was very good without him, but not nearly the same caliber. That's the truth. But what's the truth for twenty twenty two or twenty twenty one? Oof. That's uh that's a tough one. If you look at his splits, he's the same against top and bottom defenses. He does have a, a decent uh, gap at home. So, like, he was about seven points better at home. However, that that game, the Christmas Day game, was at home. And when you score 50-something <laughs> points on such a small sample of games like this, that can actually move your average in a big way. So, I've, his, his home road splits are pretty close. Kamara is very difficult heading into 2021 because he's elite. He has an elite running back contract. He will be used and showcased for the talents that he has. But how good is it, the team going to be? But how good is the team? Is it Taysom Hill? Is it Jameis Winston? Is it uh, is it Matthew Stafford? I mean, like it could be. It could. It, we have no idea who the quarterback for the Saints is going to be. At least at the time of this recording. On uh, he, on Monday afternoon here. couple things that I'll throw in here. One, we spent the offseason talking about the fact that his touchdown totals were going to rise. He ended up with 21 total touchdowns, which is an extreme number. In fact, uh, I think he's only the fourth player ever or fourth time ever that 100-plus targets 20-plus touchdowns in a season. So bear that in mind in evaluating Alvin Kamara's ceiling, right? Obviously, he was number one overall this year. If he finishes three or four or five, he still pays off on his, his top end uh, fantasy numbers. But how do you end up? I feel like here, here's where I'll go with Alvin Kamara. I know that there are variables in play and these things all have to be brought up and they will be storylines and narratives throughout the off season. But I feel like Alvin Kamara is like you go to your favorite bakery and you get the cinnamon bun, and like one day you're like, oh man, this cinnamon bun is the best one you've ever made. But they're always good every single time you go into the bakery. It does. Yes, your you worst might cinnamon bun is still a cinnamon bun. That's kind of what I'm saying. 
that's my point. It's no, like I, at the end of the day, the worst thing you have is a cinnamon bun, which is pretty good. I agree with you on the cinnamon bun analogy for 2021. <laughs> wherever Kamara's average draft position is, is exactly where I will be drafting him because the the reality is if his quarterback is bad, he will fall. He won't stay this top three pick if Taysom Hill is the starter next year. People will factor that in, the regression on touchdowns, and he'll be a, a mid to back in first round uh, pick, in which case I'll take him there. If, if somehow Breeze is back and you know they're going at it again, then then he deserves to be at the top. The reality is he is one of the very few running backs that truly is a difference maker when he touches the ball the other running backs can't do what he does um and and those guys need to be drafted at at the top of fantasy drafts yeah and, and you know he's going to have the targets it may not be breeze level but he's he's still elite number two on the list Derek Henry number two in total uh in fantasy finish number seven in consistency 75 percent of the time good games 38 percent great a bust percentage of 13%. Yeah, he had a couple. So he was he had a higher amount of great games than Alvin Kamara did. Kamara was more consistent in terms of uh, you know, his his total performances on the year. But this is a little bit of like I mean they're close enough to where it's what do you want for your team, right? I mean, you might have the kind of team or or kind of fantasy um I don't know, tendencies where you would rather have somebody that can go out like Derrick Henry did and win you week six, win you week 12, win you week 14, all by him by himself right. because he can he can have that kind of a, a difference on a single week the way that he's put up 200-yard games. I think now, when you're looking at great running backs, they can all do that. You remember Aaron Jones last season when he finished as the running back too but was very inconsistent, well, Zeke won you many weeks. And, he hasn't uh, lately, yeah. Right, but my point is that the great ones have that ability usually to have great games. What I'm looking for is what's the floor? What's the worst you can do? And obviously with the lack of pass catching, that means that his floor is lower. You've got the guys like Alvin Kamara and Dalvin Cook where their floor is high. There's no game script where they are unimportant. They're either the reason they got the lead or the reason they're uh, you know able to come back. That's it. It, it's just such a disparity of of style between players like Kamara and sure. Derrick Henry, where you have we have this refrain that we go back to: "No, oh, not pass catcher, not pass catcher." Three hundred and seventy eight carries to one hundred and eighty seven carries, whatever that special sauce is, that's worth its own discussion. When you go three seventy eight on the ground, you know you can transform that 378 into as many targets as you want in your head for fantasy point production. And he was, uh, he was actually a much better road running back and Ooh, uh, the he, road he, runner. Yeah. He, oh, meep, right. meep. Thank you. Oh yeah. We'll see. He's not, he's already, he's an already, he already has taken his animal form so he cannot he's be the, the road, road runner. runner. Yeah. And then bottom 16 teams he takes advantage of as well, which, you know, you kind of could see those games coming. Um, led the league in attempts, rushing yards, rushing touchdowns for the second consecutive year. Uh, there is a stability with Derrick Henry that is kind of unmatched. You know, when you're looking, Jason, at next year and, and the variables you see for Kamara and then everything you know about Derrick Henry, you know, where do you lean as a fantasy player? What are your tendencies? I, I hate to say this isn't really a hedge. This is where I am at. He's he's in the middle between good Kamara and bad Kamara. So if Taysom Hill is the quarterback, I would I would definitely take Derek Yeti uh, above Alvin Kamara. If Breeze or Stafford is the quarterback, someone that I think could get him the ball a lot in the passing game, then I would I would take the the, the volume of passing work from Alvin Kamara. So, but. The, Derrick Henry is the one we've said this for a couple years now he is the outlier like I want a pass catching back or Derrick Henry that's he's not like other one and two down backs obviously he's you know led the league in rushing yards the last couple of years and he is you know every time I scout we're, we're scouting college prospects right now and I'm looking at Najee Harris this awesome huge unbelievably talented back from Alabama and then I remind myself he's darn near 20 pounds under uh, Derrick Henry. He is a true freak of nature, and I, I'm happy to draft Derrick Henry as high as number three next year. 
Uh, I probably won't, depending on how things fall for uh, Saquon's health and Kamara's quarterback and those type of uh, running backs. But um, he he will absolutely be in the you know early first round. What's your dynasty feel on Derrick Henry? He's on his second contract. He is he just turned twenty seven years old. Uh, he saw I mean what were the what did we quote three hundred and seventy eight yeah carries yeah. nineteen mm -hmm. receptions so I mean over four hundred touches he saw similar work last week Derrick Henry year. or last year Derrick Henry is an outlier we we have accepted this but at the same time when you run the nuclear reactor at maximum capacity eventually that thing. It just shuts down. Where are you in terms of are you if you have Derrick Henry right now, are you looking to to trade him and be a couple years too early, or are you you gonna go one more season and then try and trade him? I'll go at least one more season. I I might right. end up going down with the ship with Derrick Henry. He's like you said, an outlier. He also didn't have any work on his legs the, the beginning of his career because he was behind Demarco Murray for so many years where he was well-rested. So even though he's 27, and that's usually an age for top running backs that I'm going, all right, I'm going to capitalize on this name, on this production, and get out before that second contract hits, he's in a unique situation here um, because of how he came into the NFL. This is almost like his first contract, and he's got big, big boy money this next year at least. They can't really get out until after this season. So I will certainly roll with him this year in a dynasty. He feels, uh, you know, just with how healthy he's been as well, like you just lock in your position for the next couple of years. You thought he had a big workload last year, 327 opportunities. He had 409 opportunities this yeah, year. 2,000 yards, fifteen or 17 touchdowns. Uh, number three on the list, Dalvin Cook. Dalvin Cook did not bust. Zero bust games. 93% good, 50% great. To me, that's better than both of the previous players like on a, yeah. on a week in week out basis i'd rather have dalvin cook than either of those guys based on the consistency totals and the truth is that he was the best runner in football this year for fantasy and That's you only it. had one game without him he week six you you didn't have him and then he had the bye week and then he was right back and right after the bye week three of those four games was the number one overall running back dalvin cook is uh unbelievable and like i think we're we're kind of at the consensus of if i have the number one pick if i'm playing best ball right now i'm drafting or whatever and we get into the draft for next year it's probably still christian mccaffrey but dalvin cook would be if you if you want to make the argument for dalvin cook i will not fight you i will not stand in your way i think dalvin cook is is fine to take at the 101 yeah, I, I agree. I think he will be my 102. Ironically, the consistency metrics here, he is number two, but number one was still this year, based on the way that we do the consistency metrics, was Christian McCaffrey, who only had three games, but in all three games was you know a, a, basically a top five running back. So he was perfect on his sample set. For all intents and purposes, Dalvin Cook was the most consistent running back this year, is in the conversation for 101 next year. Um, it's ironic though, because when you talk about unloading for dynasty, capitalizing on the huge, great year, I would rather have Derrick Henry than Dalvin cook in a dynasty, because I okay. feel like the, the style and the type of games that they play, we've seen these big explosive high end running backs, a la the Todd Gurley, um, just fall off the cliff. Eventually they, you know, Dalvin cook's well, still less, only 25 less touches. I was going to say this, Jason, just throwing it into the conversation. He has less total touches than Kamara or Derrick Henry on his career. Less work on his body well, than I those two players. Due to missing games from sure. injury. Sure, that's been part of it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the injury history is is obviously concerning. Um, and But he, was, he held up pretty well this year, got some bangs and bruises and played through it other than that week six. Dalvin Cook's great. I don't think there's much to say. When you catch the ball and are given the ball in the run game as often as he is uh, – you know, and 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 again, how many guys can you think of that are truly different at running back? Like, yeah, other guys can't do it. Dalvin Cook is in that conversation; has to be there. I do, I do have a little tiny bit of worry about losing Gary Kubiak, 
who we've seen I, over the I, last fair. I, it's a, I think it's a fair concern. The last two years, he is a mastermind a la Kyle Shanahan where he comes in, implements his run system. It always works for every running back and every system that they've ever had. I mean, whoever the backup there wasn't as good as Dalvin Cook, but was always, you know, very uh, prolific. And um, Kubiak now retiring. That will hurt uh, the the run game for the Minnesota Vikings next year. Now, technically, Stefanski was the OC when Kubiak was in a different position two years ago, and obviously Correct. Stefanski moved on and had a lot of success on the ground too. Well, we'll be interesting to see what happens. Cook at three, um, second most evaded tackles, a team that you know their identity is to run the football. Number four, shockingly, surprisingly, incredibly, David Mopportunity. <laughs> He yeah, David Montgomery running back four. Finished he mopped as, it up at the end. As the running back four. Here's his finishes to end the year. Seventh, first, seventh, first, ninth, sixth. I, I mean, didn't hear anything lower than uh, nine in that stretch. Did I catch a niner in there? <laughs> Going from a walkie-talkie? Uh, consistency rank of 10. Okay, I get that. You felt that. You knew that. When you start the year... Um, the way he did caught it. I think he had a touchdown in week two. Otherwise the first four weeks was really disappointing, but at the end of the day, 67% good games, 33% great, which I'm pretty sure before week 12, it was a 0% number on the year on his career. It felt like, and then 13% bust games. Look, everything came in. The truth of David Montgomery is that I, you should think of him more in terms of his consistency rank than his fantasy finish. His consistency rank was 10th. Everything came together for him. This is a team Everything. that 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 had you know Tariq Cohen injury out for the season, no other options. Um, the, the schedule down the, the stretch. Schedule. Yeah, Green here's, Bay, Detroit, the final. Houston. Yeah, sorry, uh, Green Bay, Detroit, Houston, Minnesota, Jacksonville, Green Bay. Like that's if you were allowed to hand pick your schedule for your fantasy running back to close the year you probably would have gone with some sort of puzzle with those pieces. That It, it was a gift from the fantasy gods that the David Montgomery uh, playoffs and end of the season was set up for su such success. So I'm with you, Andy. I am – and okay, to, and I, we don't want to just take everything away from David Montgomery. Montgomery looked different on the field. He looked like a much better player than he was uh, in his rookie season. So – he did. He did seem like he got better, but I'm not drafting him based off this number four finish. I'm not drafting him based off of what he did at the end of the year. Uh, he feels he still feels more like a third round type of a of a draft pick to me. And when you get the casuals coming in and drafting, and they see David Montgomery number four, I don't think he's going to fall there. I think he's going to get overdrafted. Well, and, and you know there were parts of the beginning of his year that he he would have handpicked Detroit. Atlanta, Carolina, and he the the thing we used to talk about during the year was oh he doesn't take advantage of good matchups and then all of a right. sudden he did it to end the year um, much better at home five points better much better against bad defenses the ones we're talking about six points better but credit where credit is due to David Montgomery yes and I think there will be with Nagy there you know Nagy's not blind to what he did you know there there he earned something over the back half of the year that he had yet to earn in the NFL. And I think you have to be realistic with how he entered the season. He entered the season. We thought he was going to be gone Duh! for the season with his groin My injury. Groin! That's true. He amazingly was ready to suit it up week one because they had to have him. They just didn't really have any other running backs. And then, of course, the first month he had three of his first four weeks were where he wasn't a top 30 running back. Uh, I, I think I think things will be brighter for him, and I'm going to be looking this offseason for the offensive line changes. Do they do they spend capital? Oh, on they the need to so line? bad because if they if they appear to be an offseason winner um, who made investments there, then I will be willing to be more serious about David Montgomery's breakout in the, the second and half and of the year. Who's the quarterback? I, I think it'll be Mitch. The I mean, Mitch all. is Mitch is a free agent right now, um, so it could be anybody. Um, and and that will clearly make a big difference. So quarterback, but I expect it to be Mitch Trubisky. I think they figured something out at the end of the year that's good enough to like, keep Pace's job and keep Nagy's job. And you I mean they're like gonna, they're 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 the negotiations with Mitch? They've they've been able to say, okay, you can play quarterback. We'll give you this much money. Also, you're tidying up the locker room, and right. 
We're like we're, we got to make some team, cutbacks. It's a team friendly contract because they're going to be making sure he does a lot around there. From it, I think they're putting him in culinary school right now. He might be in charge of the lunches. I'm not. Okay, uh, you know that's just a source. I'm just can't trying name to get right more now. out of him. Every other third quarter, he'll jump out. He'll be the lemonade guy. Mm-hmm. You just like you Grandma do. made. But <laughs> the reality is, I th I think that um, you know they were better the second half of the year. They they did uh, scrap and claw once he got back in the lineup, and they made the playoffs. And um, you know if if they re roll that team and improve the offensive line, I think David Montgomery could be a serious fantasy option next year. All right. Number five, Aaron Jones, consistency rank of number four. That was a little different than last year where he was, I believe, what, number one or two at the position, and yet consistency was a problem. Correct. And yet the truth about Aaron Jones is that he leaves his Packers legacy with a fumble, a chest injury, and a future we don't know much about right now in Green Bay. And, and you know, I know the wounds are fresh. I know that Al Borland's probably walked out of the studio already. As we bring up the way the season ended, but the player Aaron Jones was elite. Mm -hmm. Seventy nine percent good games, no bust, twenty one percent great games. And yet somehow, some way, I'm not sure that he's the kind of player that I enjoy having on my fantasy team. And I know that seems contradictory to the the finish. But there it, it's like you're waiting for the shoe to drop with Aaron Jones. You're waiting for uh, A.J. Dillon to get more work or Jamal Williams gets a, a series and and you need the efficiency from Aaron Jones on every play to, to squeeze enough juice out of that game to give you the elite draft capital payback. I, am I wrong there? No, you're right. He feels like Alvin Kamara without Drew Brees. He's awesome. He's hmm. excellent. But if he's not getting that consistent passing work because he isn't involved in the running game like some of the other big bodied backs who get the ball, you know, 15, 20 times a game on the ground. The BBBs. Then you're going to you're going to be disappointed. So it, it's really a matter of where he goes. He's an unrestricted free agent. Um, you know, if he were to go and sign for good money with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers next year where they clearly want to get the ground game going and they want to have someone who can catch the stinking ball at oh running back goodness. from Tom Brady, um, then I'd be like all in on Aaron Jones. Or, you know, if he goes back to Green Bay, I think we know what we're going to get there, which is a low volume, highly efficient running back who is worth a second round draft pick. All right. So let's let's make our predictions right here, right now. Aaron Jones. Percentage chance he returns to Green Bay. What's your gut saying right now? <clears throat> I say 55%. Oh. Producers? Nope. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> right on time. We got some weird storm stuff going on. I think that everyone's very distracted. Uh, yeah, I it's would like put snowing it, outside in Arizona. Yeah, it is, there's strange things happening right now. Uh, I would put it lower. I would say... I'm around 30%. I, 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 there was a time when I was sure they'd bring him back. I, that time is not now. I have it about 20%. Every step that A.J. Dillon took carrying <laughs> that man on his back lowered the percentage about 2%. <laughs> Isn't that like illegal fracking, though, when he runs in Green Bay? Isn't that the danger to the subterranean yeah. earth? Yeah, the, what's funny, the Jason plates was talking about the... The, you know, comparing Najee Harris to the size of, of Derrick Henry and like how oh, this guy's great, but he's 20 pounds under Derrick Henry. A.J. Dillon is the same size as Derrick Henry. Dillon is if, – if Dillon can get unleashed uh, next year, I'll be very happy because he, he would be a really fun player to watch on your fantasy team. All right, so last year he was the 18th ranked player in consistency, Aaron Jones, yet had a higher total finish. This year he's probably – nicer to have on your roster than last year mm -hmm. but who knows where he goes jonathan taylor at number six holy mm. crap jonathan taylor and david montgomery spent the back half of the year just <laughs> rising in the ranks consistency of nine for jonathan taylor um had a scary three-week stretch in the middle of the year where he looked like he had lost the confidence of the coaching staff mm-hmm and look, I mean, there were people, and it wasn't me. I was certainly jumping on, but it wasn't me. The Trent Richardson types of things were coming out oh, of that, people's that mouths. That name was thrown out. There were there were video cuts of just like highlighting one play, but when you saw that play, you went, "Holy crap! I've seen that before." And it was when Trent Richardson 
avoids oh, yeah. open holes so he can run into the butt of his offensive lineman. And then let me be fair with the end of season for Jonathan Taylor because he had second picks with David Montgomery. <laughs> Green Bay, Houston, Las Vegas, Houston, Pittsburgh, Jacksonville to end the season. So took it was advantage nice to see him good against Pittsburgh and yeah. good in the playoffs. I think they did figure something out. You saw a change um, that coincided with his efficiency from running out of the shotgun versus running under center. And I love that about Frank Reich, that he will take a look at his players, try to put them in uh, the situations Do that the right they thing. excel at, as opposed to saying, well, this is how our system works, and you're going to either fit it or you don't. Um, and, you know, it'll be interesting next year to see, is it a three-headed rotation on the roster? Do they try to bring back a Marlon Mack, who is a free agent coming off a horrible surgery or do they make the transition and go straight to Jonathan Taylor because what we saw at the end of the year was that they can rely on him he is built to be a workhorse back he's built to be a 20 touch guy this is an offensive line that can handle that and I think this could be close to a Ezekiel Elliott situation we had with the Dallas Cowboys for a while where you've got a dominant ground game with a dominant offensive line and there's just nothing you can do about it if the player can hold up and I think Jonathan Taylor can Mike it's all up to the quarterback because uh, 39 targets for Jonathan Taylor, and he was he was actually he was amazing. Like Jonathan Taylor, we knew he had some pass uh, production in his profile uh, in that final year, uh, but you wouldn't say Taylor's an elite pass catching option. But he caught all of his targets, and then right at the very end of the year, he started. He had a game where he just dropped a few. But my point is, 39 targets for a running back who was sharing time with a pass catching specific running back and Naheem Hines and Hines isn't going anywhere. Let's see which quarterback they bring in because 250 carries and in, 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 for Jonathan Taylor, maybe that drops down to the 20 target area that changes some things. Yeah. There's, I mean, there is not a quarterback on planet earth. They could bring in that will throw to the running back as much as the one they just lost. Um, so the total passing to the running back will go down. It's just a matter of does the does the carry count come up for Jonathan Taylor as the uh, dominant leader of a timeshare, or is this going to be just how this system wants to work and have two and a half running backs active each game uh, involved in the running game? And I'm not going to read too much in these splits, but he was so much better against bad defenses 19.23 fantasy points against the bottom 16 versus just 10 points against the top, but kind of getting a foothold in the offense. He just happened to play those top defenses in the beginning part of the year. Um, so I, I don't read too much into that at all. An impressive finish to the season, an impressive rookie player that I think, you know, this team should hand him the ball. You know, they did it in the playoffs. They showed confidence in him there. And uh, the second half should be more indicative of his, his future than the first half was. Yeah, the, the only rookie running backs with 1,100 rushing yards and 10 touchdowns while being over five yards a carry. Here's the entire list. Oh, man. Adrian Peterson, Clinton Portis, Barry Sanders, Ezekiel Elliott, Jonathan Taylor, and Saquon Barkley. So he, he's a, That's a he's good a special, list to be on. He's a special talent. Number seven was another rookie. His name's James Robinson. Consistency rank of eight. How many times did James Robinson on the disastrous Jacksonville Jaguars team bust this year? Uh, 16 the answer, games, so probably. This is impossible. The answer is zero, Jason. <laughs> zero I know what times. the answer is. Zero times. 71% good games, 21% great. Yeah, he had a couple moments where he was with Aerosmith living right on that edge of, of a bust game, but he never went over our threshold. I mean, it, it's just kind of a. Deserves so much credit. 240 for yes. over 1,000 yards, seven touchdowns, 60 targets. You know, two straight years, a Jacksonville running back has made his mark in the passing game on this team. And now what? Now what do you do with James Robinson? He proved himself. <laughs> Trevor Don't Lawrence know. is coming in. Uh, are people going to look at this as a one-year wonder Steve Slayton scenario, or are people going to value him for what he was? I, I can tell you right now that they are not going to value him for what, what he was. Um, making my own rankings for next year, there was no player that I hated more in my personal rankings <laughs> than where I had James Robinson. He was like my running back 18, 
And the reality is, I don't know how, uh, you know, obviously when we get down into the ultimate draft kit work and we're statting all these teams out and uh, seeing where the chips fall, he, he might end up much higher. I hope he does. But there are so many other names that I feel like I would rather have ahead of James Robinson, like a DeAndre Swift, who didn't do much this year, uh, but the talent is there, the draft capital is there. With James Robinson, he was on pace, uh, you know, a 16-game pace for 274 carries because this team didn't have really anything it could do other than keep giving the ball to James Robinson. Next year, um, I expect them to build a, around Trevor Lawrence, to try to get him more involved um, and become the leader of this team where they weren't trying to do that with any of, you know, with Mike Glennon and uh, company there. So I think James Robinson's workload comes down a little bit next year. Well, a great running game and a, a efficient running game helps a rookie quarterback succeed. That's for sure. So I'll be very curious to see what kind of work. I mean, 85% of the team's running back opportunities is abnormal. That is not something that you, right. you do on purpose with a rookie. It's something that you do on accident when you have nobody else available to you. Uh, what was it? From the very beginning of the season, Ryquel Armstead went out with COVID, missed the entire season. Divino uh, Zigbo. Divino Zigbo got hurt. Uh, Chris Thompson, he was not what we thought he was. And he Leonard also got Fournette hurt. is in the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> That's Think just, about that. I mean – you know the way that that franchise felt about Leonard Fournette and him getting to ride his white horse into the Super Bowl. How many executives for Jacksonville in a boardroom somewhere are grimacing and groaning and furious about that? I am a dynasty general manager of Leonard Fournette, and I am loving this playoff run because it gives me hope that he might sign somewhere and dupe someone again. That, Please that do it. touchdown run it was, was awesome incredible i mean at i will say at the exact same time it's it was a moment where i was watching a a complete paradox of this is a, an incredibly not athletic man doing incredibly athletic things it were like the spin and the and the mini jump at the beginning it was like you got two feet you got like a foot off the ground i don't it was it was a very bizarre run and then at the end it was it turned into this just masterpiece of a, of a run that people will actually re remember well I, I don't know when the transition was for fantasy players from leonard Fournette, the super athlete the most athletic incredible college prospect to ho-hum plotter i don't know when it happened but that moment that run that was a return to, oh, yeah, that, that was yeah. kind of the athlete and the instincts and the things that people, you know, were talking about Adrian Peterson-esque talent coming out of LSU as opposed to what, you know, we've been beaten down by Leonard Fournette in Jacksonville. Some his fault, some not his fault. He seems sure. like the kind of player who, with a better work ethic, would have had a better career, to be honest. But, um, you know. Strange, strange times. I mean, and the you you know we also have the irony now of both Antonio Brown and Le'Veon Bell. I know <laughs> are in the Super Bowl. <laughs> oh my gosh, and and Fournette. Wow. All right, <laughs> number eight on the season, fourteenth in consistency. Josh Jacobs, running back for the Las Vegas Raiders, busted twenty percent of the time. I believe that is the highest number we've seen so far. 60% uh, good games, 20% great. It was a really difficult year to evaluate what, what Josh Jacobs was. He he played, well, he missed games due to injury week 13. He also played injured at times. He also gave you a number of really, really good performances. Uh, you had nine games this year. You were really happy you played him. But I don't know. I, I feel like more people are disappointed with this number eight finish than they are excited about it. Yeah, I I can say uh, I'm just on the outside looking in because I didn't. Uh, it just worked out. I didn't draft Josh Jacobs anywhere. Not that I was actively avoiding him, but watching the year play out, it never felt like I missed out on that draft pick. It, you, you know, the week right. one, of course, it's a good way to put it. Week one, which it was Carolina, which was they were already a terrible run defense coming off of the no training camp it was we all know anyone who knows anything about football knows that josh jacobs is about to destroy the panthers in week one but after that i just 
I never really felt like I missed anything. And then, and then when he would have the big game occasionally, go, oh, oh yeah, Josh Jacobs, he could, he can kind of get it done, I guess. I think that's a a fair point. I mean, he ended up with 33 receptions, 238 yards, and no touchdowns through the air. So he wasn't giving you elite production in the passing game. Um, and 273 Thanks, carries. That, that's a you lot. Liar. 273 carries is a ton. But you know, game flow dependent, team dependent, running back on a a, a team that I think we didn't know what weeks they were going to show up as a whole. Mm-hmm. Like you just didn't know when they were going to be the good version of the Raiders or the bad version. Yeah. I mean, you know, when it comes to Jacob's consistency, I think what you felt was the lack of involvement in the passing game. You got off to such a hot, hot start where you were like, yes, this is what we were saying. Cause he's got a great ability to catch the ball. Right. Uh, I mean, you know, he, he should be used as more of a three down guy. Um, and you know, week one, he had the six targets, four receptions, but through the course of the year, he just ended up with so many games where one target, no catch, one target, one catch. I mean, it was just uninvolvement there that hurts your consistency. And the last month of the season when he was dinged up, which, of course, he was his rookie year two. So you start to wonder, OK, how much of this is is he not able to you know withstand the workload on, on his body? But the, the last month of the season where he was still OK, he finished 24th, 12th. I uh, had a bad game uh, against Miami and then um, ninth, right. he was, he, you watch the games and he was, you know, 50% of the snaps, you know, almost every 43%, 50%, 55%. And you're just going, this is not the type of running back I want. I want him on the field more when he's splitting all these carries with Devonta Booker. Well, and it becomes a thing where it is John Gruden with no patience start to, you know, you, you have a lack of confidence in putting him out there. You have to, protect him. You have to give reps to other running backs. I think that's what a lot of it was. It was if your players limping off the field every fourth play, mm-hmm. um, sure, you're tough. You went out there. You started the game. You trolled us on Instagram. Now you now you actually played. Oh, and, I forgot he did that. And, uh, you know, I, I'd be curious after that week one absolute explosion what his numbers were on the course of the whole year because that was a monster 33-point game, three-touchdown game. From that point on, he, he was only in the top five or the top 12 five times. So, you know, not not a workhorse to the degree that we hoped. And, you know, 35 receptions, is that, that's what his pace, I think, was with the missing game. It's not the end of the world at the running back position, but that's not a number you hang your hat on. He feels like a player with all the everything we are, we're laying out here. He'll, he'll be drafted, I don't know, back of the second, maybe the not third Not by round. you two. No, no. I'm saying his, his ADP feels like a back of the second, third down player. Sure. And every time you draft him, you're just gonna, you will reluctantly do it. it, well, it I, Josh Jacobs is is a very talented player, and things could turn around for him if he he gets a season, he stays fully healthy the whole time. But Jacobs is not a player I will be actively targeting. Are you going to draft David Montgomery next year, knowing what you know now, over Josh Jacobs with the potential upside and draft capital of Jacobs? Wow. If they are in the that, same... that one's tough to me. Okay. If they're in the same spot, you know, just I pick yep, one or I get spot. the other, I would take, I'd take Jacobs. I would They'll well. probably be in the same spot. <laughs> They'll probably right. be very close, I, I would imagine. So, um, yeah, that'll be interesting. All right, we have another running back episode on Thursday, so you have to rate, uh, wait for the remaining names. We do want to thank Pristine Auction for supporting today's show. Here's the truth, gentlemen, about Pristine Auction. There are hundreds of daily sports memorabilia auctions available right now. Jalen Hurts right now, a signed Eagles logo football with a display case. The current auction bid price is $20. Clyde Edwards-Alaire, signed jersey. The current auction bid price is $20. Both of those auctions end on Thursday night. Browse, check out the player. Look, maybe you want to pat yourself on the back for that title, and then you want to commemorate it with your favorite player and an autographed piece of gear. You can check it all out at pristineauction.com. Use the code BALLERS, though. If you don't use the code BALLERS, you will get negative $10 of credit. You see mm. what I'm saying? Because if you <laughs> yeah. do use it, uh, you'll yeah. get $10 of credit. So There you go. Uh, it's like throwing $10 in the trash if you don't use that code. So pristineauction.com. All right, that'll do it. 
We you guys got it. anything else? Uh, the, the storm didn't take us out. I know. No hail, no no sleet. No, we're like the post office. We I always right show up. I forward to talk about them Browns running backs on Thursday. Oh, baby. Let's do it. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.